It's a great pleasure to be here. I love the, the name of this conference, Transform. Um, I'm going to follow up with what Barbara was just saying. I think I completely agree that it's going to be important to understand what machines do well, what people do well, how they do it together. Um, but I would add to that that one of the most important things we can do at the beginning is to define the problem we need to solve. And often, I, I work in Silicon Valley. We have brilliant people, mostly much younger than I am, who are really good at engineering and design, but they frequently don't understand the problem that needs to be solved. I'll tell you the problem that I want to focus on, which I'll call the brain disorder problem. And we'll identify sort of two aspects to it. One is that we've got a set of illnesses that have very high morbidity and mortality. What is even more troubling about these is that after 30 to 40 years of innovation in neuroscience and genomics, we have no evidence at this point that we've been able to bend the curve for these. Let me give you the data that supports that kind of a comment, rather sweeping and negative and maybe depressing comment. One is that if you look at disability, which has been done now using these public health measures called the Disability Adjusted Life Years or the Years Lost to Disability, you can see that the red bars here for mental health and neurologic actually account for the largest amount of disability of all disorders. Some of this is because they're highly prevalent. About one in five people in the United States deals with a mental illness. Another piece is that they start very early in life. In contrast to cancer and heart disease, these are the disorders of young people, 75% starting before age 25. And that's why you get this large value for years lost to disability. But it's not just disability, it's also death. These are fatal illnesses with very high rates of mortality. And as I just said, that's not getting better. We've seen a 24% increase in suicide since 1999. That's, again, very different from the picture we have for so much of what we're doing in healthcare. Suicides in the last year for which we have CDC numbers, 45,000 suicides in that one year. That is more than the number of deaths from breast cancer, certainly more than the num number of deaths from prostate cancer. And as you can see here, more than double the number of homicides in the United States. The homicide rate has come down. The rates of deaths from traffic fatalities has come way down but suicide is going in the wrong direction, which begs the question, why? Why have we not done better to bend this curve when we have had such dramatic successes for HIV, for infectious diseases broadly, even in heart disease and increasingly in cancer? Why are we not able to do better? I'm gonna give you four reasons that I think about a lot one is that our diagnostic system doesn't work, particularly in children, where there's just no evidence that the criteria we have really match onto the public health needs that we've got. Another is that the most people with a mental illness are not in care at all. That is, unlike what you would see for cancer or heart disease, 60% um, of this problem is outside the care system. It's played out amongst the homeless, it's pay, played out in the criminal justice system, in somebody's basement, but it's not sitting where we are in our clinics and hospitals. Quality is a huge issue here as well. We've got a system that's very crisis driven. People are coming in late in the game. They don't come for care until they have to. And they don't like the care we give because it's highly fragmented. As it says here, it's reactive and episodic. My biggest concern, though, is none of the top three. It's that in this area, in contrast to the rest of medicine, we don't measure what we do. The lack of measurement, as it says here, is a huge problem because we don't manage what we don't measure. To borrow a quote from Peter Drucker, who was talking about business practices, but it's even more true in healthcare. We do a pretty good job of monitoring hypertension by measuring blood pressure and monitoring diabetes with hemoglobin A1C or even blood glucose. In this area, while there are rating scales, they're not great and very few people use them. In fact, the system that we have now could be changed dramatically. 
through a technology we have now, and that is the smartphone. I love to talk about this as a supercomputer because, in fact, when you compare it to the Cray 2 supercomputer, the most powerful computer of the 1990s, your smartphone is a heck of a lot better. It's got better speed, better memory, and uh, even for those of you who have complained about the cost of the new iPhone, a lot better cost. The Cray 2 was $32 million in 2010 dollars. Um, so even at a, a cost of now over $1,000 for the new iPhone, it's kind of a bargain. What's amazing about the smartphone is that it's already ubiquitous. There are about 3 billion smartphones in circulation. We think that number will go up to 6 billion by 2020. And in contrast to so much else in healthcare, which we have trouble getting people to engage on, here we have the opposite problem. People use their phones too much. Many of you are using them right now to check your email. <laughs> and this is a problem that we see all the time, particularly in young people. This is this problem of hyper-engagement. 70 daily checks, well, that's actually an underestimate. That's probably for, about right for this audience. But for people under the age of 20, you could probably put a zero after that to get a sense of how often people are using their phones. 2,600 daily touches, that is the number of times you're checking. And this is, of course, a potential global solution. I was just recently in Tanzania, where people don't have access to water or even consistent electricity, but every shepherd has got a Samsung phone tucked into his shuka robe. Amazing to see. So this is a global technology just in the last five years. It is like the printing press and the impact this is going to have on cultures around the world. And it could have an impact on how we measure behavior. So what we do today was we ask people, how are you feeling, even though we know that those people have a disorder in their subjective experience. So we ask about it, but we have no objective measure to look at the things that we may care about. We do that episodically. We do that on our terms, on our turf. And we do it in a way that's costly and has a high burden both for patients and for providers. What we want, of course, is a system that's objective, continuous, in the real world, ecological, and if it could be, even passive. So that introduces the concept that I want to tell you about very quickly. It is a concept that has to do with AI, but it also has to do with the phone. It's called digital phenotyping. And the concept here is that since we're all living on our phones all the time, let's figure out how to turn that computer into a source of health data. What would that look like? So the phenotyping has at least three, maybe even four channels to it. One is that you can look at the sensors on the phone. Activity, location, sociality, which might mean just text out versus text in, calls out versus calls in. You can look at voice and speech, which is an incredible window into how somebody's feeling. It's not just that you can pick up the early signs of neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's, but you can pick up depression. You can pick up the early signs of psychosis as someone becomes less coherent on their phone. I'm going to tell you about something that maybe is a little less intuitive and I think a little more imaginative. And it's a concept that's called human-computer interaction or keyboard effects. And in this case, you're not collecting the content of what someone says or what they type but you're looking at how they type. Now, this idea came out of not actually medicine, but out of cybersecurity. Our founder for our small company was working in the cybersecurity industry, and his task was to find hackers wherever they were in the world. And he began to realize that hackers left what he called a digital fingerprint by the way they would type, the reaction time, the patterns that they would take on the keyboard, the lag between scroll and click between space and delete, all of those issues, that we all leave these subtle but very robust signatures for how we type. And so what he did was he took that into a way of actually becoming um, what was a forensic tool in cybersecurity and has become the basis of a whole field called behavioral analysis. His company was bought out. He had a background in healthcare, he thought, whoa, maybe I could use this for something related to healthcare, and hence got into digital phenotyping. And the idea here is 
You collect data on lots of people. You also use gold standard measures to understand their mood, their cognition, their behavior. And then through machine learning, you find the features that map onto those, and you can put those together to create this digital phenotype that we're very interested in. Now, there's another channel I'm not going to talk much about, but it's a very interesting one of looking at what we call digital exhaust, like uh, social media posts, search terms. There's a whole range of other kinds of data sources that could also be intriguing, um, a little more intrusive. We should talk maybe in the Q&A about how one could use those without overstepping the bounds and getting into something that looks more like surveillance. Just a little deeper here, we have about 45 different keyboard measures that we can pick up. And because we're doing a time series where we're picking these up all day long as people are on their phones, we can create something like a 1,000 potential, we call them digital biomarkers. And then what we do, of course, is to validate those in a whole range of different studies, some of which are studies of cognition, some are studies of mood, and some are actually done with neuroimaging to see whether these map onto brain circuitry. I won't have time to take you through this entire story, but just to give you a feel for what the data look like, the blue are how people have performed on gold standard cognitive tests. The red are the digital biomarkers and how they map onto that. These are 27 different people. Each dot represents a person's score. And I think you can see across a whole range of different tests, there are different digital biomarkers, different panels of features from the phone that begin to map on and give us a pretty good representation of how someone will perform on a gold standard cognitive test. You can do the same thing with measures of mood. This was a study of, of 10 different subjects. Each bar represents a different subject. So the first subject was seen about maybe eight or nine times, the next one about 20 or 25 times. And this is looking at patients with depression treated with ketamine, rapidly acting antidepressant, Fascinating story that people get better right away, they, re they recover, but they relapse within two or three weeks. So we looked at this as people had multiple treatments with ketamine, we would go through a cycle of recovery and relapse, recovery and relapse. We weren't interested in ketamine, we were interested in finding the phone features that would detect changes in mood. And sure enough, this is looking in blue at the Hamilton depression score, in red, at what we can see with the digital biomarker, and it's a pretty good representation. So long story, but the short summary is that we now have, we think, a way to get objective, continuous, ecological, and entirely passive measures, because this requires that patients do nothing other than use their phones, which they're already doing way too much. Now, the beauty of this is that not only can you detect the issues, so we sometimes call this a digital smoke alarm because it gives us very early signals about when somebody's relapsing or recovering. That's this part on the digital phenotyping, but you can use the same platform for interventions. And some of those can be the kinds of classic psychosocial interventions that we all talk about, CBT, DBT, those sorts of things. But it's also the possibility of changing the way we do care management, a huge issue for the treatment of depression, which is almost always in primary care, is how to build collaborative care. This gives us the kind of uh, data capture, the kind of dashboards that can help to really empower care management. And most of all, by putting all of this together on the same form factor, you can create a kind of learning health engine. You can have a closed loop system, all powered by AI, that gives you now a moment to moment way of monitoring and managing care. This is what some of that might look like. We won't go through it in detail, but just to say that the phone is really this powerful device for both collecting data and for sending out signals. In a world in which there is so little continuity of care, this could be a game changer. So to summarize, I've told you those are the four problems that I think have kept us from being able to bend the curve here. And what I want to suggest to you is either through these kinds of signals that we can pick up or through the way we can deliver care, we can actually identify every one of them and begin, I think, to make a big difference. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that um, the phone is the new mental health care system. I don't think it is, but it's a part of a system where we can begin to do the things that we've been missing. Better diagnosis, the fact that people don't wanna come into our clinics, this gives us a way to engage the fact that we haven't had any continuity of care, this gives us the connectivity, and the fact that we haven't been able to measure, and now we can begin to measure. Now, if we do that, we're not quite home. 
I think there are two really critical factors that are getting in the way of making this the transform system that we want. The first is we still need to demonstrate the value of this in the real world. What we've been doing is in research studies where people are consented, they basically are partners in research, um, they're small studies. I think we've demonstrated the feasibility and the promise of this, but what we really need to do is to demonstrate its effectiveness in populations of people in care. We need to show that people will actually engage with it, which has been an, an enormous issue for digital health. And we need to show that it's not just generating data, but it's actually saving time. It's improving the efficiency of care, which is a huge issue for anybody in the care system. And I think if we're able to do all of that, we're not even halfway home. Because the other piece of this, which we have to begin to figure out, is how to do this with public trust. There, I think, it's setting out a whole new realm of guidelines. I love that, that talk this morning about putting in the airbags and, the, and the, uh, the safety curbs. That's what we're gonna need here. Making sure there's real transparency about what's collected on whom, when, and where. Giving people some agency over the data that are collected so that they feel like this is being done for them, with them, not to them. And then making sure that privacy is handled in a responsible fashion, something that has not happened by many of the big tech companies and now has to be rethought by all of us. We're in the middle of what we sometimes call a tech lash, the backlash against tech. Uh, a kind of simple north star for this for me is to say, are we doing this in a way that empowers patients and families with information? And if so, I think we're on the right track. So I'll stop there, I look forward to further discussion, questions about this. Uh, my own perspective on all of this is that we're still kind of in the first act of what will be a five-act play. I think we've seen some of the characters that will be in this very interesting drama, but I don't think we quite know how it's gonna all play out, and that's something we'd love to engage all of you in helping us think about. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Insull. Tom Insull from MindStrong. And before we go on, I just wanna, I should have said this before you started, but don't forget, while you have your smartphones out, please keep submitting questions the way we were doing this morning, and that is at pollev.com slash TXFM. I just wanted to get that out as well. Did a great job this morning. Uh, we're, obviously, this is your conversation as well, too, so uh, if you are using that smartphone uh, or whatever device you have, go to pollev.com slash TX. FM, and please submit those questions. We, we, we got some great questions. Before we go on, I just want to ask one quick question of you, Tom, because we introduced this concept of AI in the introduction, artificial intelligence, and why it's going to take a different uh, phrasing of that, of, that, of that term. When we think as laymen and novices to this, in what you just talked about, is there AI simply in the phone because it's so good at what it does, or is the AI actually happen in what we do with those data? Great question, and it's the latter. Are they actual collecting the data? That's the easy part. Mm -hmm. The really tricky part of this is making sense of enormous amounts of data. So it's the analytic side of this that uh, becomes the great challenge and is still very much a work in progress identifying what signals are not false signals. So we, we sometimes call these uh, digital smoke alarms. What we don't want is a lot of false positives and we can't tolerate a lot of false negatives. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be really good at that point in understanding how to use machine learning to get the signals that matter. Very good.